Good evening and welcome to you all. For anybody joining for the first time in this series, I'm David Hewan and welcome from all of us at Garrett Publishing. To you and those who have joined us for the last two weeks, I'm truly grateful that you can join us again today. Before I hand over to our panellists and leaders tonight, there are some important items, if I may. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I join you from. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. And I extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait people from the many lands on which you join us from. Sorry for those who may be familiar with my coming spiel, but these sessions may offer educators accredited professional development hours. Certificates will be issued by the Australian Catholic University and Garrett Publishing after all of the four weeks have been completed. There are some requirements, however. Hours can only be gained by viewing these sessions live. To ensure tonight's hour is registered, I would ask you to use the chat function in Zoom. I would ask you to send a message, include your name and email. Ideally, these would match the name and email that you registered for the session. Also, to help us administer your accreditation, please add your name and email in a single chat with no other name and uh, no other notes. If you wish to say hello to all and welcome, it will it will very much help us at Garrett if you do so in a separate chat message. The chat function allows you to communicate with everybody or me privately if you prefer. I'm registered as Garrett Publishing. The evening Zoom will be recorded, so you're able to revisit tonight's insights. However, we cannot accredit you any hours if you only watch the video later. We must work on an honour system to ensure that these hours are accredited. As per the last couple of weeks, we'll have the video up on Garrett's website in coming days, and we'll send a link out to the recording. Sometimes an email from Garrett may not hit your main inbox and God forbid it might have ended in your junk folder. Surely not, but if you, can find, if you can't find the links to the last two videos, I will put a link in the chat during this evening's event. Should you have any questions for tonight's presenters, I would ask you to use the Q&A facility. Feel free to log any questions you may have. We've allowed some time to answer as many as we can through the evening. A warm welcome to Claire Johnson, our, uh, our constant over the la over these four weeks. Claire is a professor professor of liturgical studies and sacramental theology, and the director of the Australian Catholic University's Centre for Liturgy. Claire is also the Australian author of our Celebrating the Lectionary books, which we will refer to tonight. And also a very warm welcome to Dr. Janine Luttick. Janine is a full-time lecturer in Biblical Studies at the Faculty of Theology and Philosophy at ACU. Prior to her appointment there, Janine spent 25 years in education, in primary education, in Catholic education offices, and in private consultancies to Catholic schools in the area of theology, biblical studies, pedagogy, and learning design. Her current research focuses on the depiction of children in the Bible, and she is also interested in modern biblical hermeneutics. Enough from me. Claire and Janine, over to you. Thank you so much, David. And uh, it's lovely to be back with you all tonight. Um, I am also very delighted to welcome my colleague, Janine Nuttick. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Janine in a little while, but she joins me from ACU's Faculty of Theology and Philosophy, and I'm so pleased to have her with us tonight. I thought, as we have done over the last couple of weeks, uh, we might begin with a prayer from one of our little books. Um, let me share my screen so that I can um, share that with you. And hopefully you can see that now. There you go. You should be able to see that. And uh, I thought we would take a prayer from Celebrating the Lectionary Year B, which is the, the focus of our uh, our session this evening. We had Year A last time, we're Year B this time, and guess what, Year C next time. This uh, prayer that I've chosen comes from um, 
year B, as I said, and is from the feast of uh, St. Mary Magdalene. So there's a little image of St. Mary Magdalene. And this one can be celebrated every year on July the 22nd. So let's pray together just to start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Trusting God. You chose St. Mary Magdalene to be the one to discover the miracle of your resurrection and to carry the good news to your followers. May her example of courage and leadership inspire us to be unafraid to proclaim your good news throughout the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So St. Mary Magdalene is one of the saints that we feature in our Holy Day Solemnities and Feasts section of celebrating the lectionary year B. We'll come back to her in a little while. I'll tell you a little bit more about her. Um, take note in the, um, the icon here, which is one of the Eastern icons from one of our Eastern traditions, that she's holding an egg. I'll come back to the egg a little bit later. Maybe you can have a little think about what the egg might mean for St. Mary Magdalene there. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been introducing you to some of the great features of these volumes, just to help you to understand a bit more about the liturgical year and to explore these books with you. And one of the aspects of these books, which you will find helpful, are the introductions to the various sections. So I thought we would encourage you not to skip over the introductions. Sometimes people have a bit of a tendency, kind of like when you've got the manual for your car, you just kind of get in and start driving and you don't necessarily know all of the cool things that it can do. Well, these books can be a bit of a, a temptation in that way as well, just sort of dive in and start using them without necessarily gearing yourself up to understand absolutely everything that they can do. But these introductory parts of, of oh, parts to the different sections can certainly help you to understand a little bit more about the particular time or season or period of the year that we're entering into. So these are the sections that you'll find that each has an introduction in the, the books. These are in years A, B and C. Um, the first section, Catechising uh, with the Word of God, of course, orients you a little bit to just the overall approach of um, lectionary based catechesis gives you a little bit more of a sense of the rationale behind the books and behind the, the notion of using the lectionary as a foundational stone for catechesis so that you can build on that um, and, and provide solid educational, theological and doctrinal and in fact liturgical in this case ground um, for whatever other faith discussions happen to emerge as you're working with your students. Um, and you know when you're engaging in this, this particular approach to religious education um, or catechesis or in fact lit children's liturgy of the word these can be used in all of those different contexts as well another of the sections is uh, is the saints of the liturgical year and this one lists you lists for you um, the saints that you will find in the Australian and New Zealand ordo or liturgical calendar and of course the ordo is a little bit different depending on what country you're in there is a general liturgical calendar that is universal for the whole church so some of the saints are so big that the whole church celebrates them regardless of of where you are but there are always nuances for local calendar saints and local occasions that are marked in a particular country um, or region's uh, way of celebrating. So Australia and New Zealand have some saints and some occasions that are very particular to us that we make a bigger deal of because they're more important in terms of our understanding of, of history and saints that have been particularly important um, for our peoples. And so we, we have our own little unique list there. So the saints of the liturgical year that you'll find um, in that section gives you that that list of saints that are on our auto. Now, obviously, we couldn't look at absolutely every one of them in the in, across the three volumes, but you'll find that we've picked about 30 uh, across the three volumes that you can explore over those three years with your students. And they're very varied and very interesting. We'll look at a few more of them tonight, the ones that appear in year B. But if you wanted to explore with your students some of the other names that are on that list, I think that you'll find that they're all quite interesting as well. Another of the sections is the Doctrinal Connections Key. Now this one of course lists for you the official documents that are referenced in the books. Um, and this would be where you could explore some of the more sophisticated teachings of the church, some, some um, more detailed theology with older students if you wanted to use this as a basis for working with older students. So the books obviously, as we said last time, are aimed 
at that years five through eight kind of age range but you could use them to work with younger children or you could use them to work with older children and this would be one of those areas that you could really mine um, to take older students into looking at some of the deeper issues that are um, engaged with these teachings in the doctrinal connections doc documents there um, and you know it's worthwhile arming yourself with that information too. Most of them are available online easily enough if you do a Google search so you can just find those and a lot of them you'll find um, on the Vatican website and the US Conference of Catholic Bishops website and the Australian Conference of Catholic Bishops website as well. We then have introductions to Advent and Christmas time and Lent and the sacred Paschal Triduum itself and then Easter time and ordinary time and these sections, of course, provide us with a flavour for um, each time or each season. And they outline the major readings that you'll find in um, or the major themes that you'll find in the readings and the prayers for each of those particular times or seasons, as they used to be known. The, um, the Roman Missal that came out in, in 2011, we started using that, refers to them as times rather than seasons. We still kind of use them a little bit interchangeably, but essentially it's it's Easter time rather than Easter season, for example. Um, but the introduction to each of these will give you a little bit of background on how, the, how we celebrate that season, what sort of liturgical colours are we utilising, what sort of decorations do we use, um, what sorts of, of uh, practices do we engage in commonly or can we start engaging in if we haven't commonly done those before. So things like the Advent wreath and all of those, it gives you a bit of a sense of, of what's happening um, to characterise that particular time of our liturgical year. And of course, one of the reasons why we celebrate these times or seasons within the liturgical year is that they provide Christians with opportunities to ponder particular aspects of the Paschal mystery of Christ's life, death, resurrection and ascension and what they mean for Christian living today over the whole of the year. So we, we mark that whole Paschal mystery during each of our liturgical years. Um, and rather than simply a day or a week of celebration marking out an aspect of Christian faith, we have an entire season or time period within which to focus our attention on particular parts of our history and particular parts of our belief system. And helping your students to experience the changing rhythm of our liturgical year will give them a sense of how Christians mark time together. So time plays such an important part in all of our existences. We're stri striving to start and finish on time, get to places on time, make meetings with people that utilize time. And Christians also think about time in a particularly Christian way because Christ became one of us in our time, in our world, and so he has sanctified time. So we need to think about it from a theological perspective too, which is one of the things that the liturgical year gives us a chance to do. I wanted just to offer you a little note on um, the readings for the third, fourth and fifth week of Lent. Now, the, a, a number of parishes celebrate the or mark or work with people through the rite of Christian initiation for adults. And when parishes are preparing people in those final weeks leading up to the Easter ceremonies in which those people will be initiated through the RCIA into our Catholic community, the custom is that we always use the readings from year A for weeks three, four and five of Lent. They're called the scrutinies and they're a way for those that are preparing for baptism to really focus on particular aspects of their faith and prepare themselves fully to celebrate their baptism confirmation and receiving first Eucharist, which happens at the Easter Vigil. So where you have a parish that usually, that celebrates the RCIA, goes through that program and process of prepare, preparing people to celebrate baptism, they always use the year A readings. But what we've done in years B and C is that we have included those other readings as well, because not every parish celebrates the RCIA. We don't all have, all have programs like that um, in our parish. So you've got all of them, A, B and C for those three Sundays, the last three Sundays of Lent, but only year A are used in RCIA parishes. All right, a lovely little feature of these books that you may or may not have noticed is that there are some little icons that decorate the top corners of the first page of each section or each session. 
And I wanted to explore these icons with you because these have a particular history and a particular set of meanings that I thought it might be fun to engage with a little bit. So we have four icons representing the evangelists. These are not the ones that you'll find in the book. I'll show you those in a moment. But Matthew is, of course, the represented by a winged human being or an angel depending on how you interpret it. A mark is represented by a winged lion, Luke, a winged ox, and John, an eagle. So we'll explore these a little bit now, just because they are associated with each of the evangelists or the gospel writers. And it's nice just to have an idea of what they actually mean. So in these four books, these little icons indicate what period, time or season of the liturgical year that we are in for each of the entries in the book. And the entries in ordinary time indicate th that we have a focus on year A, year B or year C. Um, and these images have been associated traditionally with each of the named evangelists. So Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Not surprisingly, these images, these icons or symbols have a scriptural origin and they um, are taken from a reference in the book of Ezekiel to four living creatures that draw the chariot that God is in. This is in the very first chapter of Ezekiel. And they're also recalled in the book of Revelation uh, in chapter four, verses six to nine and following, but the, the focus is, is those verses. Now, Ezekiel describes them as living creatures, each of which has four faces. So they have a human face, a lion, an ox, and an eagle on every creature. So there are four creatures, each of whom has four faces. Um, and so we have this, this scriptural depiction being applied to uh, the Gospels because we have four Gospels. So that each of the Gospels has, um, has its own association with one of these symbols, one of the faces of one of the creatures. And four versions of the gospel, but one unified narrative. So each of the creatures has four faces and the gospel has four versions included in the New Testament. So there's a lot of um, a legend that goes on. So it's one unified narrative told from four different perspectives. And the explanation of these representations of the evangelists first came to us or was first attributed to St. Jerem. Um, you can see his dates there, 342 to 420. He's, he is the one that's first, that first attributed these icons to the evangelists. And their explanation has sort of advanced a little bit over time. And, and the one who kind of is a, a um, given responsibility or, or um, thought to be the one to have developed it further is Robanus Marus Magnensius. And his dates are there. You can see 780 to 856. And he said that each of these icons representing the gospel writers um, has three different layers of meaning or interpretation. So firstly, they represent the evangelists themselves. So Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Secondly, his intention or his, his re reading of them is that they represent aspects of the nature of Christ. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And thirdly, they represent the virtues that Christians should aim to engage in uh, if they want to live out salvation, live out for salvation. So here's Matthew, and this is the icon that you'll find in um, celebrating the lectionary year A. So Matthew, the angel or the winged human, I'm going to use the inclusive language here. But this is thought to represent the highest form of humankind um, and represent the king of creation made in the image of the creator. So a little bit of, of Genesis in there as well in terms of the understanding. Um, Matthew is the name to which uh, which has been attributed or attached to the first of the New Testament gospel accounts. Um, and we know that it's likely that it's the work of a community of faith associated with Matthew the Apostle, a former tax collector who was called by Jesus to be one of the 12. So this winged man or angel um, is a little bit sexist, but, you know, we'll, we'll call it a winged human being. And Matthew, of course, begins with the genealogy that traces Joseph's lineage back to Abraham. So we've got this focus on humanity going all the way back to the great father Abraham there. And Matthew, of course, focuses on exploring the incarnation of Christ and Christ's human nature. This, of course, is the explanation that was given by our, our um, early medieval um, interpreter there. And the icon of the winged 
human being indicates that Christians should strive to use their reason for salvation, which is not a bad thing. Using reason is a good thing. So that's Matthew, the first one. Mark is a winged lion. And you'll find this little icon in celebrating the lectionary year B. Now, Mark was not an apostle but rather was a follower of Peter. So he was called an apostolic man. Um, and he was uh, the, the, the second of the earliest of the gospels was attributed to him. Um, and even though we know that, you know, uh, he is included second in our, our New Testament, the gospel of course is first. I'll leave Janine to, uh, to deal a bit more with Mark as, as she comes up in a moment. But the symbol for Mark is the winged lion, which represents the highest form of the beasts of prey or the carnivorous animals. Um, lions are fierce and courageous in nature, the king of the animals, just as Christ is courageous and the king of the universe. The Mark and lion is also uh, understood to represent the resurrection of Jesus because lions were believed to sleep with one eye open. Now, as a cat owner, I can tell you that I'm not sure that that's the case. She often has the eyes fully closed. It doesn't take much to wake her up, though. <laughs> um, but this, of course, drew comparisons with, with Christ in the tomb. Um, so he little bit of, of you know um, exaggeration there in terms of the the interpretation there but that's the uh, the attribution um, the icon of the winged lion indicates that Christians should use courage on the path to salvation when we get to Luke we find the winged ox as the the icon there now Luke is the most clearly identifiable of the evangelists and was a doctor who wrote the gospel of Luke to Theophilus and the book of Acts of the Apostles he was thought to have been a close friend of St Paul of Tarsus and the symbol for Luke is the winged ox or the bull which is the highest form or the king of the grass eating domesticated animals and of course the bull or the ox is also quite closely associated biblically with sacrifice with service and with strength in terms of the way that they are used in farming. The ox signifies that Christians should be prepared to sacrifice themselves in following Christ. And the final of our final one of our icons, though this one doesn't actually appear um, in the celebrating the lectionary books, but I thought I'd just include it anyway, because otherwise we'd be missing him, is John. And John is represented by the eagle. And you'll, you'll often see um, the ambo in cathedral shaped in the shape of an eagle. And the eagle, of course, is the king of the birds. Now, John was the youngest of the apostles and the author of the fourth and most recent of the New Testament gospels. It was written around 95 CE. Whether these people actually existed or whether it was a community of faith that was built around these people is up for speculation, but we, we attribute the fourth gospel to John. And the symbol for John is an eagle. So associated with the sky and traditionally eagles were um, believed to look fear fearlessly into the sun, straight into the sun, whereas most of us would be cringing away. The eagle um, is able to look straight into the sun. Um, so what else about the eagle? The eagle symbolizes that uh, Christians should look in look on eternity without flinching um, as they journey toward their goal of union with God. So the four gospel icons there, we only have the three of them in our celebrating the lectionary books, but John is certainly there and may well be the shape of the ambo um, that you rest the lectionary on when you read it. So we focus particularly on Mark in year B, and I'm going to uh, leave that to our scripture scholar, Janine, who'll be joining us in just a moment to unpack Mark a little bit more with us. But I wanted you just to know a few more things that we've included in celebrating the lectionary year B. Um, and of course, this list will be familiar from last time. The only addition to this list um, in terms of the Holy Day solemnities and feasts is Ash Wednesday. So we have included Ash Wednesday, an entry on Ash Wednesday in lectionary year B and C. Uh, we didn't include it in year A because we didn't think about it, but we did after that. So it's in year B and year C. And they're different, uh, different activities and a different interpretation in each year. The highlighted or bolded um, solemnities or holy days on this list have a new entry for each of the liturgical years. So you'll find a fresh Australia Day, a fresh St. Mary MacKillop um, in year B and in year C. Um, and the other list of our saints featured in celebrating the lectionary year B, St. Josephine Bakita, a Sudanese Italian saint who died in 1947. Very, very interesting she is, well worth exploring. We included St. John of God, who was a 15th century Portuguese saint, 
and a founder of an order that's focused on healthcare. So many of you are probably quite familiar with St. John of God Hospitals and St. John of God Healthcare. So we thought it would be nice for our students to explore that with us. Um, St. George, April the 23rd. Who doesn't like a good dragon story? We couldn't resist putting George in there. So you can uh, have a bit of an explore of, as to um, whether it's actually a dragon or a crocodile. We're not quite sure, but it's, it's quite a nice little story to look at St. George. Um, St. Mary Magdalene, of course, jumps in there. I mentioned her before. July the 22nd, if you've got the egg in mind from before. Um, apparently, the, the, the legend is that after the ascension, um, Mary Magdalene journeyed to Rome, where she was admitted to Tiberius Caesar's court because of her high social standing. And um, after describing how poorly Pilate had administered justice at Jesus' trial, she told Caesar that Jesus had risen from the dead. And to help explain the resurrection, she picked up an egg from the dinner table. And Caesar responded that a human being could no more rise from the dead than an egg in her hand could turn red. And of course, the egg turned red immediately, which is why red eggs are exchanged um, in Byzantine churches around Easter. So Mary Magdalene is often depicted with the egg. I won't go on about that anymore, but it's kind of interesting to look at the iconography a bit. August the 4th, we have St. John Vianney, uh, an 18th century French parish priest. Um, and, and our focus in this is on the parish priest and the role of the parish priest in uh, leading our communities. St. Clair gets in there uh, just because, you know, it's a good name. She's a 13th century Italian saint and um, she founded the Poor Clares community. She was a follower of St. Francis of Assisi. We had to put the angels in there. We've got to talk about angels at some point. So Saints Michael, Gabriel and Raphael, the archangels, get their own feast on September 29 and we have an entry on them for you to explore with your students. St. Teresa of Avila gets in there as well. St. Teresa of Jesus, very important 17th century Spanish Carmelite nun and of course because musicians need to have somebody in there to represent them. Saint Cecilia is in there, who is the patron saint of musicians. And finally, we thought it would be nice just to include Saint Andrew as well, the apostle and the older brother of Simon Peter, um, who left his, his life and his work to follow Jesus. Um, he's, he's also very interesting too, and has a, has a great little icon and um, a symbol. So it's worth exploring that together with your students. I think my time is up and it is time to hand over to my lovely colleague who will focus on Mark with you a little bit more celebrating electionary year B. Janine, I'm about to stop my screen and hand straight over to you. Thank you very much, Claire. And uh, while I'm just making sure that my uh, that my slides are there for you to see. I just want to say thank you to Claire and to Garrett Publishing for asking me to be part of this program. It's a great privilege. Thank you very much. And a, a particular thank you to the participants that have um, that are involved in tonight. Uh, thank you for spending your precious evening time with us. Um, what I would like to do tonight is just open up an idea of, of Mark as a gospel of hope. And uh, for me, in the liturgical year B, all of us, students, young people, children, those of us that, um, that attend Eucharist, have a chance during ordinary time, in the ordinariness of our own lives, to sit and be in dialogue with Mark, to contemplate uh, what Mark can offer into how we think about ourselves, our God and our world. And what I'd like to open up for you tonight is thinking about Mark as a gospel of hope. And for me, this gospel, uh, I'm very biased. I have a, an ongoing love affair with the gospel of Mark. Um, but I think part of the love affair with Mark is because it speaks into the experiences of the contemporary person, the person today. And uh, I think Mark has a lot to offer uh, the young amongst us and the not so young. So the children, the students we teach, the, the colleagues we have, the people in the pews. Um, uh, I think Mark, in a sense, holds up a mirror to how we experience life today. And I think particularly of the experiences of our young people. So I want to talk a little bit about those first because they really set the context, I think, for how we think about what we invite students into, into this dialogue with Mark's gospel. So when we think of young people today, when I think of young people today, I think of a world dominated by the internet. 
And that brings our students and our young people uh, into a world that no longer has boundaries. They can communicate with people all over the world, family and friends and beyond. But what's also happened is that they've been uh, immersed in a world also that can uh, result in cyberbullying, as we know, and the kind of trauma and sense of betrayal that, that the effect of that has on our, on our young people. Our young people also are part of a world where they know loss and grief. Uh, they can't escape it in our world today and that it is very much part of their experience and not just in terms of pets or friends or family, but we know we live in an Australian society that, that has to address the issue of youth suicide. Our, our grief and death are very much part of our young people's experience. We also know that uh, we live in a society where many of our young people uh, experience loneliness and anxiety and fear. And in some ways, I think they can find a home in the Gospel of Mark. They also live in a world of uncertainty, whether that world uh, is uncertain due to war or due to the pandemic, whether it's due to climate change and the natural disasters that come with that, and sometimes the human-made disasters that, that come with that, and we think of our, our barrier reef and what's happening up there with bleaching, et cetera. We also have young people who know what it is to live in a, in a world of extraordinary abundance. But we also know we have children and young people in our world who live in extraordinary poverty. We know that we have children whose world is characterised by deep love and sense of connection and a sense of community. But we also know that we have children whose world is, is dominated really by neglect and abuse. And these are the children who will sit with Mark's gospel uh, in our classrooms, in our catechetical sessions, in our parishes, in year B. So, I think as well as that, we also have young people in our midst who don't want this sense of um, despair to be the marker of their generation. And we've had uh, in the last 10 years, young people themselves who have risen up, um, who have had to face uh, huge odds themselves and have risen up to point the adults amongst us in a direction of hope and have tried to pave the way for those, uh, those of us in their world uh, to a more hopeful future or a future and a world that is very different to the one they experience now. So young people themselves uh, really are, are searches of hope and are beacons of hope. So before we have a look at Mark's gospel and how that gospel uh, presents hope to us, I want to give you a minute just to think for yourself what you associate when you think of this word hope. And let's draw on some of the ways that hope is spoken about in our world today. For some people, hope is about imagining a world that's really different to the one that I currently experience. And we see that in the likes of Grace Tame. Hope is the courage to believe in something better than what we experience now. For some people, hope is simply about hoping for the best, being optimistic and persevering against the odds. For others of us, hope and fear are very closely intertwined. In fact, for some of us, hope only springs out of fear. For some of us, hope is about just not giving up. And for some of us, hope is about facing reality, not denying reality and going into wishful thinking, but it's about facing reality but not being held back by reality. And I think that book there, The Story of Anne Frank, that many of us would know, is really a story about a young child who faces reality but is not held back by that reality. So she composed a whole series of letters and diaries while she was in hiding uh, in Holland uh, during the Nazi occupation uh, in the hope that one day they would be put into a much bigger archive as a testimony to the suffering of Jewish people under the Nazi occupation. 
So she faced her reality head on, but also pointed to a time beyond that when this story could be told as a way of ensuring that this kind of suffering didn't happen again. Some of us sometimes, though, and I put myself in this category, we associate hope with false hope or sometimes uh, mix up hope and wishful thinking, and that can be really problematic. Some of us, when we think about hope, think about people, and I've put some of those images up before us. And in particular, we think of those people who are particularly resilient or determined or active, proactive or are optimistic when faced with suffering. So these kinds of ideas about hope are picked up, uh, are a mirror really of some of the ideas that Mark invites us into in year B. So let's go a little bit further and let's uh, have a look at Mark's particular take on hope. So what can we learn about hope from the Gospel of Mark as we sit through it through year B and contemplate this gospel and celebrate this gospel? To answer, to look at that uh, of what Mark, uh, what we learn from Mark, about hope, it's really important to start off by saying, why on earth did Mark need to convey ideas about hope in the first place? What was happening in the first century that a story of Jesus' life being told as a story of hope was really crucial. So for the, many early Christians in the first century, particularly those for whom Mark, we think Mark is writing, their experience was one of great suffering physical suffering uh, in the form of being persecuted because they identified as followers of Jesus. Um, early Christians were persecuted and those it, it forced some of those who identified themselves as Christians to deny their faith in Jesus. Sometimes they had to dob in members of family uh, or friends in order to save themselves. They were often put in a position of choice. Do I save my life or do I give my life over knowing that will involve suffering and loss? So it's in this context that Mark writes this story of hope. So some of the themes that we see come up in Mark reflect the kinds of experiences of the early Christian community. So we see it very early on in Mark in chapter one, where we have this story about Jesus uh, walking along uh, Galilee and seeing a couple of guys uh, amongst them, James and John, the, their brothers, the son of Zebedee, and he immediately calls them. They immediately get up and follow him and they leave their father Zebedee with the hired men and they follow Jesus. So straight away in a story about what it means to follow Jesus, Mark from, the, from chapter one tells us that to follow Jesus will involve some sort of separation. And lo and behold, it may even involve separation from, lo from, from loved ones. It may involve separation in such a way that uh, it leaves others feeling uncertain. You can imagine what the father Zebedee uh, may have imagined was going to happen to his life when the two key people in his business leave their livelihood is um is put at risk is compromised so straight away mark says to follow jesus will involve cost the other experience of of the early christians was one as i said of physical suffering for some mental suffering some of them isolation when they had to make choices as to whether they would stay with family or attach themselves to the early Christian community, which involved fear and suffering and persecution. So this, this experience of the early Christians is reflected uh, when we get to chapter five in this really um, vivid story of Jesus' healing of the Gerasene demoniac. And look on chapter, look at verse three in how Mark explains the setting of where this demoniac lives. The man lives among the tombs. He lives among the dead. He doesn't live among the living. 
He's possessed by an unclean spirit, which some of us would uh, think today maybe means he, he has some sort of mental illness. And the mental illness manifests itself physically. So much so, it, it, it overpowers him and shackles and chains, very uh, vivid imagery. They can't restrain him. In fact, his illness is so strong that it even breaks shackles and chains. His illness is so strong, it even comes out in his voice of howling and the self-harm he does to himself, bruising himself with stones. And it's in this context of suffering, mental, physical suffering, death and despair, that Jesus offers this man a chance for healing and a chance for peace. When we move then to uh, much later in the gospel, when we get to uh, Mark's gospel is a very short gospel. It's the shortest of all the gospels. It's only 16 chapters long. And uh, for most of it, up until about chapter, uh, chapter 13, most of it is in Galilee. Uh, but when we get to chapter 13, the setting changes to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, as we know, is the place where Jesus will be, uh, will suffer and will be crucified. So when we get to uh, chapter, uh, I'm just looking at my screen here, chapter 14. Chapter 14, Jesus has been arrested. He's been betrayed by Judas. Most of his uh, followers have, have abandoned him. And he goes before a trial. And while he's being tried by the high priests, his close friend Peter, who's told him, no matter what, I will always be with you, staying quite close to Jesus, is in the courtyard of the high priest. But lo and behold, when, when uh, one of the women, one of the servant girls who works for the high priest seems to identify Peter with Jesus, he denies it. A little bit later when some of the bystanders um, in the courtyard reiterate that they think that, that Peter is one of those Galileans, he denies it again. And then he denies it a third time by saying, I don't know this man you are talking about. So not only does he not, not deny knowing Jesus, he completely abandons Jesus. So this theme of betrayal within the early Christian community is reflected very much in Mark's gospel and a sense of betrayal and the despair that goes with that. And when we look at verse 72, the author of Mark says that, G, that Peter broke down and wept. So this, this idea of denial and betrayal of, of intimate friends is something that's really cutting in the, in the early Christian community and is reflected in how Mark narrates the story of Jesus. I guess the story of uh, the experience of abandonment and the, and the sense of despair really comes to a head in how Peter, uh, how Mark describes the death of Jesus and in verse 34 which is something that we hear in good on good friday at three o'clock Jesus cried out with the voice Eloi Eloi lemma sabachthani which means my god my god why have you forsaken me so Mark puts on the lips of Jesus this utterance at the time of death that he, that even god has abandoned Jesus very different to what you'll see in Luke in year, in year C, where Luke says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Mark's interpretation of the death of Jesus is quite different and it invites us into this deep sense of abandonment and despair and desolation. But we know that's not the end of the story. And Mark moves on after the story of Jesus crucifixion and death to the story of the empty tomb in Mark 16 and Mark's pretty clear here that despite a whole narrative that's really talked about loss and suffering and despair and death 
that those key themes of the early Christian experience are not the final word. They are not the defining features of Christianity, although they are very much part of the experience. And he tells the reader this when he says he, the women go into the empty tomb and there is no dead body there. The body is gone. Jesus is not to be found amongst the tomb, amongst the place of the dead. Where is he to be found? He's been raised and he's gone to back to Galilee. He's moved from the place of death in Jerusalem and he's gone back to Galilee, the place of healing and teaching and ministry, which is where he is to be found. What's really interesting about uh, how Mark uh plays with these verses is that he also says to the women go and tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee and I find that really interesting because these the disciples and Peter in particular had abandoned Jesus and yet abandonment and failure are not the final word for Peter for for Mark The resurrection is a way of saying that even though the people that hurt us most are redeemed at the end and are brought back into the fold at the end and are brought back into the ministry of Jesus and back into the presence of Jesus. I'm going to, we can maybe come back to those if you want to. The other thing that's really interesting about this story is the very way that Mark ends it. And it ends at verse 8. So the, the, the man in the robe, which is a, 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 a divine figure, a divine, divine messenger, who the women come across in the empty tomb, tells the women to go to disciples and Peter and to say, look, Jesus is ahead of you in Galilee. Look at the reaction of the women. They go out. They fled from the tomb. So look at that verb, fled, rushed out in fear. For terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's the original ending of Mark's gospel. It's a very weird ending. And in fact, so weird that uh, writers a couple of uh, uh, decades on decide to ta- tag on a few extra endings to Mark's gospel to make it clear, to, to clarify the tension. But originally, the story finishes there. And I love this ending because this ending says to me that uh, the resurrection doesn't necessarily take away fear and uncertainty, that we always live whilst we have a promise of hope in the resurrection, that fear and uncertainty are part of our human experience. And this this is means that we have the requirement of the need for faith. What I also like about this uh, ending is that we know, 21st century, that the Gospel of Mark has been prayed and preached for over 2,000 years. So clearly the women did eventually go and say something. So fear and uncertainty are part of the Christian experience and they're part of our experience. But they don't have to be the final They don't have the final word. Eventually something shifts in us and we move to hope and we go and share that hope with others, even in our most despairing of of moments. So what I love about the Gospel of Mark is it's an invitation for you to invite young people and children and the people in your parishes to dialogue with Mark and to, ha- and to keep asking the question during year B, where do I find hope in my world? Because we know that young people's experience of world today can be a bleak one. Not for all young people, but for many young people. So Mark asks us, invites you as the leaders of learning to invite your students to acknowledge the darkness and contemplate the signs of hope. 
to ask as you contemplate the gospel, uh, the gospel of Mark in year B, where do we find hope today in the places of violence and war? What are the actions that we take today as Christians to continue the story of hope in our own world today? And for some of us, it can be something as simple as lighting a candle. We give our students the opportunity to, to talk amongst themselves and with Mark and to celebrate in the liturgy the ways in which we are invited to continue the story of hope in our own world today in a world of violence, in a world of gendered violence, in a world of racism, that these things that are very much part of our experience do not have the final word that there is something different and better that we can hope for. And amongst a world where we know our young people are very anxious around um, the future of their lives in terms of the planet, that we hold out ways that 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 we can that they can see their way through that despair to see chances for new life to see chances for hope and to be proactive around ensuring a future for themselves and for others that is one that engages the 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 uh a, the, the sacred hope, the divine hope that Mark points the way to in Mark's gospel and for those early Christians. And I think for me, the Easter focus in Mark's gospel is very much one where, uh, and I love this idea of the egg, uh, Mark, that Claire talked about, Mark in chapter 13 talks about um, a time when uh that in order for hope to emerge for the early Christians, that there will be a time of great labour pains, a time of birth pangs. So in order for life to emerge, uh, in order for new life to emerge and hope to emerge, it's almost necessary that we need to face our suffering and face the despair of our life. So Easter for me is a really important time as a, as a Markan scholar because it's a time where I'm really uh, invited into not uh, into admitting the parts of my life and my world that aren't helpful or are destructive or are not of God and to face those and to be led by Mark and Mark's narrative of hope into a time and into a promise of something that's a very much different, uh, a different reality, a reality of compassion and healing, of ministry and forgiveness and of new life. So I hope as you use these books from Garrett uh, that you constantly are using them to uh, break open this story, which is not just the story of the early Christians, but their story is really mirrored, mirrored still in our story today in the 21st century. And that with these books that you can use them in a way that enables children and young people to see a way through their, the human experience today and a way uh, into hope, Mark and hope. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Janine. I guess we'll hand back to David. And hopefully everybody can see your two smiling faces. And thank you very much. Janine, uh, talk of hope is, is uh, it's not just, I think, young people, but we all um, are looking um, and really struggling to, to find hope um, and joy um, in our days um, over the last couple of years. Um, but really, you break open uh, Mark's gospel so beautifully. Um, and a number of people have said, oh, you know, you're so interesting, so relevant, um, and uh, uh, really enjoyed tonight's session again. So you've given a, Janine, you've given a, a different flavour 
um, uh, than we had last week, which was sensational with Claire and, and Elizabeth. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just having a look here. There's actually no questions as such, but, um, you know, there's some comments around the fact that, you know, technology, um, the pandemic, um, us coming out uh, of the pandemic, which really we haven't come out of as yet, um, present so many challenges at parish level and at school level. So there are a number of comments that have come through um, from that perspective. Um, so, uh, Alison here um, has said, uh, um, I've just lost her here. Hang on, just bear with me. Um, thank you. Uh, in, absolutely riveting. Um, your both of your presentations tonight. Um, thank you so much, Janine. It was great listening to you. And again, uh, share your views on Mark and how we can use Mark in the classrooms. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to find uh, Claire. This, you know, um, these are so useful, Claire. Thank you very much for these sessions and the books. Um, so that's nice, uh, nice feedback because uh, for a lot of people don't know, there's a hell of a lot of hard work that Claire had to put into these books over a, a pretty long journey. Um, <laughs> as she's smiling there. <laughs> um, it's well, wonderful, though, for folk, folks to be able to just focus on one, primarily one gospel and B gives us the chance to look at Mark. And I agree with Janina. I, I, I love the, the visceral nature of Mark. It's very raw um, and not quite so polished or sophisticated. It's sophisticated in its own way, but not quite so polished as, as the others, perhaps. So it's, it's wonderful just to immerse yourself through the liturgical year in that gospel. And the same for the other liturgical years, but B is is, is really wonderful there with with Mark. So Janine, you've you've given people a real hunger, I think, to uh, to head more into there into Mark and and really and look for hope throughout the whole gospel, which is a wonderful thing to be searching for. Yeah. So no, not too many questions. So clearly, you were so articulate, both of you, um, that you already answered all of the questions that people might have had in their <laughs> heads. But you know. Um, yeah, it's really good to see comments such as, you know, I can use Mark, I can now use Mark's gospel to help children see through the darkness and find hope. Um, so uh, if we are able through tonight's sessions to touch just one person, one young person, um, one teacher, one young person, then that's fantastic, I think. And I'm sure we'll touch many, many more. Um, we're getting on to uh the time so um i am going to add myself uh, i'm sure people don't necessarily want to see me i again i, I apologize for um uh, making some errors in the zoom setup but um please be aware that we've sorted it out so um formally on behalf of everybody here today um thank you claire thank you janine um, please support Claire's work by visiting Garrett and purchasing one or all of the celebrating the lectionary books. Um, a three book set is on sale. So you can save a little bit of your measly RE, resort, RE budgets um, by buying now. Um, we'll send out the videos in the next couple of days. Um, we'll send out uh, tonight's link and also links to the last two weeks in case you haven't got it. Um, and Claire will be joined by another ACU colleague next week in Emmanuel Nathan. So we're looking forward to that. If you don't want to buy from Garrett, please feel free. Actually, really, please support your local bookshop wherever you may be. Support them. If we don't support our local bookstores, they won't be there. So please consider buying local. From all of us, thank you very much. Um, uh, from all of us at Garrett, our very best wishes. We thank you for your support and good night. <laughs>